Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office wrapped up its second annual conference. This video features excerpts of remarks by State HP staff, Department of Economic and Community Development Commissioner Catherine Smith, Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation Board Chair Sarah Bronin, and two of the five main presenters, namely singer-songwriter Dar Williams, talking about her new book, What I Found in a Thousand Towns, and artist Titus Kafar, whose TED Talk, asking, Can Art Amend History?, is at 55,000 views and growing. He's an art world star who I first became aware of from his Jerome project at the Studio Museum in Harlem. His work reconfigures and regenerates art history to include African American content and is shown at MoMA, the Yale Art Gallery, and elsewhere. He spoke about NXTHVN, Next Haven, an art space he co founded on Dixwell Avenue in New Haven to cultivate a sustainable creative community that attracts and supports talent within and beyond New Haven. Representatives from more than a dozen preservation-related organizations had displays in the exhibit hall. There were the usual award ceremonies and breakout sessions in the afternoon. I loved author Natasha Wing's backstory on her new children's book about when Jackie saved Grand Central. It made me nostalgic for the days before preservation became so focused on tax credits, environmental compliance, adaptive reuse, and government grants, when it was driven by passion-driven people who loved history, loved architecture, loved places, and were willing to practically take a bullet to save things with no expectation of being paid to do so. There's some good stuff here, and it was a good turnout. Decide for yourself. My sense, the idea of an annual conference to inspire, honor, and reflect on the problems, prospects, and possibilities of preservation is good and necessary. Alas, not one of the presentations addressed the power and wonder of Connecticut's own built environment, or the 101 challenges and opportunities we face on the ground here, not the least of which is the Pre that the preservation movement that was so upward bound years ago has maybe not aged well, needs renewal and a renewed sense of purpose and public engagement. Check out these excerpts and feel free to add a comment. People in, this community, in our communities who haven't necessarily had access to this because of, of poverty or other reasons also deserve access to the amazing cultural heritage we have. And Chris Beer totally gets that, embodies that, and brings that to our work table every day. So, Christina, thank you so much for all you did. And by the way, David Corris, maybe you could just stand for a second. David is the new deputy commissioner at DECD. He joined the team two months ago, um, and he has responsibility for brown fields and all of kind of the development inside of our communities. Over the past seven years, um, we've worked really carefully with um, with brown fields to take some of these amazing, amazing historic. Uh, buildings and put them into better use. So obviously a couple of great examples. One right up in Hartford, the Cape World Horse Nail, Nail Company. I love, I don't know if you've been inside those apartments, they are phenomenal, right? All the old brick walls and it, this was historic Roosevelt Mill in Vernon, uh, the J.R. Montgomery Mill Complex in Windsor Locks, and Bruce Becker is with us today, hi Bruce again, um, who did the 777 building in downtown Hartford and turned that into a fabulous set of uh, of apartments. Uh, $445,975 was awarded under the survey and planning grants to help recognize and document and promote preservation around the state. And that is all very important on the grant side. But we also know that one of the reasons that those um, mills were able to be redeveloped and that a number of other projects around the state have been successful is because of the tax credit program, and, and Joe Courtney alluded to this at the federal level, but we now also have a very popular, I might add, state historic grant preservation. And last year we awarded um, 34.7 million in tax credits to 29 projects. So uh, there's three big things that we want to do. Uh, the first one is continue to make a big impact. The second one is engage and inspire. Uh, the third one is strengthen our organization as an organization. Um, so we, just going real quickly through these three topics, so making a big impact. I mean, a lot of you know that the Connecticut Trust has had a significant impact in the areas of uh, tax credits in uh, utilization and in advocacy. Uh, you know that we have the Circuit Rider Program, which has very successfully brought expertise into your communities. Uh, you know we have an easements program that's one of the most robust in the state. We have the Barnes and Mills uh, surveys, which the mill survey, uh, all, all work, uh, much of this work has been supported by 
the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, but in looking forward, what we want to do to increase our impact is expand a lot of these programs, expand our survey work. Uh, we have, we're taking new ideas for surveys, uh, so uh, we're brainstorming within our board for that, and continue to advocate uh, for, through that award. But there's a lot more we can do, and in this category of engaging and inspiring, we've identified the need to reach new audiences. Um, so just this last month, a few of you, including um, uh, uh, representatives of the State Historic Preservation Office, attended the Latinos in Heritage Conservation meeting, which was in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, subject matter bridges, too. We talked a little bit this morning already about resilience and, and climate change. But the environmental movement, the climate movement, uh, and historic preservation really have a lot in common and haven't talked to each other that much. So it's our hope uh, at the Connecticut Trust that we can expand um, subject-wise as well. By all these aspects of the past, when you go to New Orleans, a friend of mine moved there for a few years, she went to a party, right off the bat was invited with a new friend, and it was a costume optional party. Her friend said, I decided to wear a costume. You know, 20 minutes before she called, she goes, by the way, I'm gonna wear a costume. She shows up at the costume party, this woman totally decked out, and my friend Katie, who was new to the city, said, how did you do that? How did you pull that all together? And the woman said, well, I have a costume closet. <laughs> <laughs> that is New Orleans. I went, there is a sense on a larger scale that the party is still happening. It's fun. You feel pleasantly haunted by the past. And, and, it's, and so I think about Hartford and I think what contains that and gives that sense where history is there and it feels, it feels like something and it feels good. So that's a real question. And, and I put that out to you um, as uh, historians, both as in form and function, because in function, there are bridges to be built to create, to bring that past into the present in that resonant, fun way that gives people a sense of identity, uh, a layer of identity. But the other thing in terms of sort of the form of this is that historians, all of you, I know, are connectors. And you know, I look at, a, there's a real range of ages here today, there are a lot, it's, it's male to female, there's a diversity in, on various levels. There's this historical moment, and there's what we know in the present that come together to tell this new story. It's, it's this idea that I want to hold on to, I want to preserve the ideas of the past, but tie them together, weave them together, tell two stories at the same time. This is something that we haven't been able to do very well as a country. We really like to have one clear, clean story. An individual is either wholly good or they're wholly bad, and the idea that some people have good characteristics and bad characteristics doesn't really work well for us. And so my work has struggled, I physically struggle, I wrestle with these things. This is a painting that's about 11 feet tall. The painting is crumpled up, <coughs> it's crushed, and there's one character in this painting for which this painting was not intended to be the focus, and it's the, the figure on the right-hand side framed in, in the next uh, image here. We, we have this history, and there are things about the past that we don't know, because there are, there are historians from that time were focused on different things. They were focused on different people's stories. Every single square inch of this 40,000 square foot building is going to be curated, including that space. It's a great big gallery. Part of the big thing for us is we are going to be highly curated. We want the best of the best. We want to make sure that the best artists come into that space, that are inside of that space. A lot of times what happens in, in the community that I grew, grew up in, communities like the one I grew up in, is people don't give us the best. People don't give us the best. We get these sort of side projects and people mean well, but I want the very best of the best. The folks who are showing with me at the Smithsonian, I want them there. The folks who are showing me with, at MoMA, I want them there. I want them to understand that this is a valuable community that has a lot to give to the artist. So, you walk in, there's an art gallery right there, and on the right-hand side, um, there are studio spaces. The studio spaces, this is my favorite part of our project. We have a tiered mentorship program. So the artists in the building each have a apprentice. Each apprentice is a high school student at Hill House High School down the street from us. We're one block away from Hill House High School. 
So these high school students come in and they get paid better than minimum wage to work as studio assistants for professional artists. And so we have the opportunity to introduce them to the highest level of art through the traditional way of doing it, through working for another artist. I always say Michelangelo wasn't a great artist because he got an MFA from Yale. Michelangelo was a great artist because he apprenticed under another artist. That's how it happened. In this moment in time, we are beginning to charge artists so much to get an MFA, we believe very strongly that that is going to shift. Either the institutions, the universities are gonna change that, we're going to go back to the old way. 